Stay tuned for the rest of the video, but first, a word from our sponsor. This video brought to you by Frag Pro Shooter, one of the best mobile shooter games of 2020 designed for mobile platforms with over 60 million players worldwide and 1 million playing at any given time each day. In Frag, you can collect over 80 unique characters with their own powers, create your deck to build your strategy, and destroy enemy bunkers. Each new version of the game features a new character, like the latest edition, Stella the Good Witch, who is summoned to Queen Unicorn's court after realizing peace couldn't be kept in her absence. She has the power to shoot a star from her broom that explodes on impact for major damage. The game also features several unique modes, including Payload, where you can be the first player to escort your cart to the center of the map and win, or slow down the enemy's cart to get an advantage. You can join clubs to play with your friends and frag together. And there are free rewards for you, only thanks to the link in the description, even for those who've already installed Frag. So see you there. Now back to the video. So anyway, it was all over the ceiling and the school janitor wanted like nothing to do with it. But I had an alibi because I had the most reading hours that week. So the teacher took me and a few other kids to Sonic for lunch that day. Are you talking about the alien secreted resin? Uh, yes. All right, can it, space trucker. We got a distress call from this vessel and it's our job to seek and destroy any alien sons of bitches. So you ever seen one of these things before? I hear they're like stabby, wet skeleton penis monsters. Yeah, they're pretty moist for some reason, but they're not that bad. Just look at this. Anytime I've seen them, they're pretty lame. Alien is the landmark 1979 sci-fi horror film that stunned audiences the world over by taking the hopeful, peaceful setting of deep space exploration and making it fucking scary. Since then, it's gone on to be one of the most iconic movie franchises of all time. The series is most known for its grim, gritty, dystopian future setting, its mysterious, masterfully designed alien antagonist, and its emphasis on strong female leads. The series has easily one of the coolest fictional creatures in one of the most interesting settings and it seems like a no-brainer to translate that to video games, allowing you to explore this oppressive atmosphere and simulate battling the deadly space bug yourself would be a blast if handled properly. And with a franchise license this well known and successful, you just know they have to have tried it a million times. So which ones showed us how terrifying this creature is over the years? To answer that, we'll have to look back at some of the earliest appearances of the terrifying black penis monster on the Commodore 64. Oh boy, talk about some humble beginnings. Being that we can't exactly get our hands on a lot of these games due to them being offline, impossible to emulate, or incredibly rare, bear with us if we can only give a surface level look at some of the smaller entries in the series. We may also talk about one or two versions of a game if there's like 15 ports of it. This video's already been long enough without a review, so let, uh, let's get to it before you click off. Oh god, oh jeez. Alien Began Life is a game franchise on the Atari 2600 with a not very good Pac-Man clone that sometimes rips off Frogger too. After that we get to Alien on the Commodore 64, which is... Kind of like a text-based adventure game with incredibly basic graphics to visualize the action. At least that sprite looks like the alien this time. Next up, Aliens the Computer Game, also on the Commodore, based on the second movie. It's starting to kinda look like a game. Flying sequences, environments to explore, and some basic combat. And even a rough recreation of scenes from the movie. The catch is that this game is 20% action, 80% HUD. Good god. Aliens! Alien 2 is a neat little side-scroller shooter on the MSX where you play as Ripley blasting through aliens and trying to save Newt. Aw, oh, look at how Bredges. Killed off-screen in the sequel. Well, all these are, uh, let's say quaint attempts at creating a game based off the franchise, but they didn't really have that same level of excitement. They certainly lacked the technology to mimic the film's memorable visuals and atmosphere. We didn't capture that until... Your turn, Bozo, get in there, I suck at side-scrollers. Until... Oh yeah, now this is more up my alley. Aliens the Arcade Game was released in 1990 and developed by Konami. Remember when they used to make video games? This side-scrolling shooter just oozes bodacity. From the second you pop in that arcade token, it's non-stop breakneck speed of shooting down all sorts of xenomorphs. 
This being an arcade game, keeping the experience fresh and well paced is a much more crucial element than it normally would be in a console game. The primary form of gameplay is walking from left to right and shooting down anything with a heartbeat. But soon enough you'll be switching to a third person perspective where you're shooting enemies in the background or riding an APC as you rush your way across a highway to rescue Newt. Mowing down aliens is really satisfying with a smart gun, but you can pick up other weapons like a flamethrower or rocket launcher. You may have noticed that the developers took some freedom with character design. Ripley's hair is totally a different color, but that's easily forgivable when you get awesome variants of the xenomorphs. You won't find these in the movies, but I totally buy these different breeds of aliens that may have resulted from a facehugger latching itself to a certain animal or a different alien that's indigenous to the planet. I also love the different funky colors on these xenos, like purple and green. They make the sprites really pop out of the screen and make for some really sick action figures. Best of all are all the different bosses. You know you have a good boss design when it comes out of the shadows and the first thing you say is, Ew, what the hell is that? My favorite one is this one that looks like a giant ribcage with gross tentacles coming out of it. But of course there's only one way to end an Aliens game, and that's with a boss fight against the Queen while manning a power loader and forcing that bitch out into the void of space. Aliens the Arcade Game is a fun action romp that can be beaten in around 30 minutes. It's just the right length so it doesn't feel dragged out and it stays fresh from beginning to end. Also thank god for emulators, because this thing would have eaten a boatload of my quarters. If you thought the Alien Queen laid an overwhelming amount of x acts and Aliens, that's nothing compared to how many versions of Alien 3 Probe Software developed. There are 7 versions of Alien 3 spread across different platforms with an 8th developed by Bit Studios for the Game Boy. But I'm gonna be focusing on the SNES version since it seems to be the most popular one. This game managed to impress me in multiple ways. First, the visuals. I mean I'm easily impressed with 16-bit era video games so this is no surprise to me. I think games of this graphic style will forever stand the test of time. Just look at games like Super Metroid and Donkey Kong Country. Timeless. I love how they use effects like rain and smog and that parallax effect to add some depth. I wasn't expecting this game to be as open as it is. You don't simply go from left to right and reach the end of the level. You walk up to a terminal and you have a list of missions that you can take upon in any order you wish. When you accept the mission, your objectives will be marked on your map and it's up to you what route you want to take. It can be easy to get lost though, because once you leave the terminal, you don't have access to a map, so you gotta keep in mind where your objectives are located in relation to your position on the map. If you do manage to get lost, you can just reach one of the multiple levels on the map and reorient yourself. But still, it can be a little annoying. I wish I could just pull up the map anytime I wanted. Missions are pretty varied. To give you some examples, some have you rescuing prisoners, repairing leaky pipes, or destroying some x -Zacks. You gotta be careful not to be a little too trigger happy because ammunition is limited and enemies are plentiful. If you use up all your ammo or carelessly take damage, it can be a while before you come across the next ammo or health pickup. This resulted in some pretty tense moments where I was trying really hard to not take a hit from even the smallest face hugger as I was desperately trying to find a health pack. There are also some platforming elements, which are the weakest part of this game because Ripley has a really awkward jump. It's not egregious by any means, but it can sometimes be a little tough to land on a moving platform. I did like that you have the ability to cling onto pipes and move across them like monkey bars while still having the ability to shoot. That's always badass. Like many retro games, this is no walk in the park, and it can be a challenge for even the toughest and meanest of space marines. However, through dying in this game, I did find what is easily the best part of the Alien 3 video game. And that's getting to hear Bill Paxton's famous game over, man. in the game over screen. Ever wondered how you would fare as a colonial marine? Well do I have news for you. Light Gun Rail Shooters brings you closer than ever before to living out your fantasies of pumping lead into space bugs. The first ever Aliens Light Gun arcade game was Alien 3 The Gun. This game is a light adaptation of, you guessed it, Alien 3. Instead, it's told from the perspective of two marines if you so happen to have a co-op buddy. You go through different environments of Fiorona 161 as you mow down an assortment of xenomorphs, as well as some robots and Wayland troops. At the end of each level, you face off against a boss. They're not the most inventive bosses, sometimes being a bigger version of a facehugger or a regular old xenomorph. I do like that when you clear stage, you're given a rank depending on your performance. 
it really incentivizes you to go all out and impress all the ladies in your local Dave & Busters. Pro tip, don't shoot the prisoners. Sorry guy. At the end of the game, you fight a mysterious man that comes in to retrieve the alien specimen. After you take him down, a bunch of whaling troops show up to riddle you with bullets, John Marston style. You served well, Marine. Now leave your initials and turn in your well-earned tickets for a Xenomorph plushie. Aliens Extermination is an arcade rail shooter from 2006, and I gotta say, this series lends itself incredibly well to that format of gameplay. It's all about a bunch of melee monsters of various sizes and types running at you down corridors while the main characters blow them apart with sci-fi future guns. They were practically made for this. So this game, weirdly enough, has the same setup as another game on our list. A group of marines go back to the space colony Hadley's Hope, which should be a big smoking crater, but whatever, and needlessly fight more aliens even though they could have just left them alone or nuked it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. These environments are good at evoking the look of the movie, but not too many of them feel all that familiar beyond that. The alien types are pretty standard until you get to this monstrosity. How exactly an alien dragon came to be is a mystery to me, but it makes for a neat boss fight, I suppose. To mix things up, you also fight a few combat androids, including one in a power loader with a buzz saw. The game ends with a nice little boss against an alien queen where you set up a nuke. I bet you could have just done that, you didn't have to do it be on the ground. And then fly away successfully, Oh, <laughs> Well, given how much these games seem to respect the source material, I'm sure that explosion was just really bright, but didn't actually burn anything. So all these aliens are just going to be seeing spots for a few hours. I may be jumping a few years ahead, but it felt right to package these games together. Aliens Armageddon is the next rail shooter in the series from 2014. This game is about what would happen if aliens actually got to Earth. Like that comic book, Aliens Book 1. Which is to say... DOOM! Now you and your space marine bros are in a mad dash through a futuristic city to get to a big spaceship where you guys can bail on this planet. Along the way you fight of course some recognizable bioorganic bad guys. But because every species creates a different type of alien when implanted by the facehuggers, there are a lot of different types to battle. Some of these I have no idea how the hell they could have been made. Like, what animal makes this? A, a rhino? Are these ones like eels? Where did they get wings? Can a facehugger manage to wrap itself around a pterodactyl? Why is this one the size of a house? And that one's another dragon alien, but it's like 50 times bigger, oh my god! But anyway, I really liked this game when I played it a few years ago at the Chuck E. Cheese with my dad. It was cool that the blasters looked just like the pulse rifles from the movie. It's pretty similar to the Terminator rail shooter that came out shortly before this by the same developer, but it still fits together. I like the idea of fighting aliens in an urban city environment since we don't really get to see that often. If the world ever goes back to being normal again like before the alien parasites invaded, I'd love to hit up an arcade machine of this one again. What is it now, Herrickson? Aliens A Comic Book Adventure is a point and click adventure game released in 1995 and developed by Cryo Interactive Entertainment. Despite its title, there's nothing about this game that screams comic book to me. I expected a graphical style that evoked the medium, things like panels, speech bubbles, onomatopoeia, and flipping pages as the story plays out. The only thing that deems this game a comic book adventure is that it's a pseudo follow up to Alien's Labyrinth, a comic book published by Dark Horse in the early 90s, which is an awesome read by the way. It's one of the most gruesome alien comics I've read, and they dig into some really interesting aspects, like how the alien hive mind works. But you're better off thinking of this game and comic as two totally separate stories. For the most part, the game has its own cast of characters, but some characters share the same name as some found in the comic, even though they're two totally different characters that have nothing to do with each other, besides the shared name. Like Lt. McGinnis, who is a technician in the space station Inominata in the book, and Lt. McGinnis, who is a microbiologist aboard the USS Sheridan in the game. These discrepancies may not be a huge deal, but they're enough to cause confusion. I wish the game would just drop the comic book part from the title and tell a completely original story instead. You play as Henry Herrickson, a clear nod to Lance Henriksen who plays the android bishop in Aliens. In classic alien fashion, the story begins with the crew members of the USS Sheridan waking up from cryosleep and responding to a distress call from a nearby planet. The rest of the crew consists of the aforementioned McGinnis, the microbiologist, Williams, captain and pilot of the ship, and finally O'Connor, science officer and number one xenomorph fanboy. I trust you, O'Connor. 
What's the problem, chum? Need a little reassurance? Is it the idea that we might meet up with aliens that frightens you? These guys are a bunch of assholes. They waste no time in being some of the most unlikable characters I've interacted with in a video game. They take every opportunity they can to insult you, tell you how incompetent you are at your job, and make the most condescending remarks. Tell me frankly, Captain, what do you think of me? You don't know how to handle a woman, but otherwise you're okay. Say, Cap, you think I'm a good leader? All you've done so far is talk. Pretty good at that, ain't you? Have you looked at yourself lately, you ugly slob? I've got things to do, dammit! I've got no problems, musclehead, but you seem to have a massive one. O'Connor, do you think I'm a good enough leader? You're the primitive prototype of a colonial marine leader. You're not too bright and you stick to orders. No one expects any more. Alright. It doesn't help that Herrickson is also the most insecure protagonist I've played as. A lot of his dialogue options consist of questions like, What do you think of me? How do I look? Geez, I don't know how you put up with me. For crying out loud, man, you've been appointed as the leader for this rescue mission. Instill some confidence in your crewmates. But to be fair, Herrickson isn't the most pleasant guy either. He often speaks with a lot of aggression, and you get lovely dialogue options such as, Do you think the doctor is good in bed? Hey, let's go beat up that science nerd. I'm gonna kick your teeth in. Yeah, these are exactly the kind of people I want to be stuck in space with for months at a time. Like I said before, it's strange to me that this game misses the opportunity of taking upon a more comic booky aesthetic. Instead, the game combines 2D illustrations for the characters and 3D rendered environments. I'm not about to tear apart someone else's artwork, god knows I can't do any better, but man, some of the expressions on the characters are so extreme that they look kind of freaky. Shit! He's dying! Uh... McGinnis, you're at a 13, I need you to bring it down to like a 7. I think the CG on most environments look pretty good, especially in ones with heavy shadows and interesting lighting. When characters are animated, they do move really awkward and stiff, kind of bordering the line of stop motion, but it wasn't offensively bad. What was, is how disorienting the camera angles can get. When you transition from one scene to another, you often get these hard cuts that change to a totally different angle, but there's no continuous shot and the fact that Harrickson doesn't move in real time, losing my place in the environment happened to me often. This is really annoying when you're trying to make your way across a simple hallway, or when dealing with the game's most annoying feature, a time limit. There are several sections in this game where you can't leisurely explore the environment or take your time solving a puzzle. The game will cut to a short cutscene, letting you know that death is around the corner. The game immediately starts with one of these scenarios, when you wake up from cryosleep, the ship is in danger of colliding with a bunch of asteroids. There's no visual representation like an on-screen timer letting you know how much time you have left, so you really have to focus on completing the mission before being greeted by a game over screen that then boots you back to the main menu. Don't be like me, save often. I'll admit, this is a good way of setting up suspense and putting some pressure on the player, cutting to an ominous shot of asteroids hurling toward your ship or xenomorphs trying to break down a door can be pretty stress inducing. But this feature quickly starts to get annoying the further you get into the game and environments get bigger and puzzles more obscure. Finding key items and figuring out what to do with them is the main gameplay loop of this game. Solving these puzzles is pretty straightforward in the beginning, but then they start to get really confusing when you pick up generic computer parts or just random tech. In a setting where there's a computer terminal in almost every room you enter, it starts to feel more like guesswork than puzzle solving. Combat in comic book adventure is barely worth talking about. When you encounter an enemy, the game changes perspective into an isometric Diablo style view. Combating the enemy is as simple as equipping a weapon from your inventory and right clicking where you want to attack on the grid based layout. You also have the ability to move around to avoid attacks in this mode. It's far from an engaging combat system. I never was the biggest fan of point and click adventure games. The ones I've enjoyed the most are the more streamlined telltale games that have a bigger focus on a branching story depending on your dialogue choices, and less on pixel perfect item hunting. Sadly, Aliens A Comic Book Adventure isn't going to be the one to win me over on this genre. But I think there is potential here. A choice driven game where you build relationships with your crewmates in the vast emptiness of space, where no one can hear, you know what I mean. It sounds like a cool idea. I get that you're trying to calm me down, man, but I'm hearing noises all around us. 
I keep stepping in squishy stuff that's giving me flashbacks to fifth grade. Any food left over? Aliens don't eat that, right? Nah, just coffee. It's the only good thing on this ship anyway. Uh, I was hoping for some eggs. Hey, which arm hurts when you're having a heart attack? Why? Does your arm hurt? No, but my chest does. Wait. Something. Oh, no, just some gas. You lock that shit up, Mendoza. And please, don't say eggs again. Those things have a nasty tendency to... Uh-oh. Ah, shit. Jeez, we really stuck you with all the retro stuff because I can't run emulators. Yeah, the first half of this review is pretty Diego heavy. You wanna read my review of Alien Trilogy? So like, you wrote it, but I'll be saying it just so we can have more speaking parts for me in the early parts of this video? Yeah, basically. Should I do it to Brooklyn accent? Please, God, no. Alien Trilogy! Voiced by me, but written by Diego. The first proper first-person shooter based on Alien came in the form of Alien Trilogy, released in 1996 for PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and DOS. Probe Entertainment took the helm for this one. The title of this game led me, or Diego rather, to believe that this game was one big adaptation of the first three Alien movies, retelling the events in chronological order. Instead, what we have here is more of an amalgamation of the first three films. Alien Trilogy takes elements from each movie and uses them to more or less tell an original story. A very basic one at that. This even reflects in the player character. We assume control of Ellen Ripley, who's a colonial marine in this game and is sporting a shaved head. Fans of the series won't look past the fact that Ripley was never a marine in the movies. So again, some inspiration from the supporting cast of badass marines from Alien, some from Alien 3 for Ripley's appearance, and we have this phony Frankenstein version of Ripley as our main character for this game. As Ripley, we're tasked with going through different environments from the movies, such as LV-426, Fiorina 161, the derelict ship, and clearing them of any alien organisms. Most of this game's story is delivered through text boxes at the beginning of each level, detailing your objectives on that mission. But there isn't really much context beyond shoot the ugly space monsters. Occasionally you're treated to a CGI cutscene setting up the locale for the next chapter in the game. They don't do much in regard to moving the plot forward, but there's something to look forward to after you've cleared the previous chapter. Alien Trilogy is what can effectively be described as a Doom clone. Copycats of the legendary first person shooter were as plentiful back in the day as they still are today. With good reason. This style of gameplay has aged like fine wine. It's a very basic gameplay style, but one that can accommodate for many different genres. Horror, sci-fi, fantasy, you name it. The most prominent aspect of a Doom clone is probably its graphic style, which consists of NPCs, items, and the player character's hands and weapons being a 2D sprite in a 3D environment. I think, uh, well, Diego thinks, this graphic style will stand the test of time. It's such a stylized look, and even its shortcomings are easily forgivable. Like the fact that these sprites lose detail and get uglier the closer you get to them. As time went on and with the introduction of analog sticks, these games started to give players more control when it came to aiming. But during their infancy, aiming was limited to the x-axis. As someone who is more familiar- What the fuck are you- what, <laughs> Phoenix, what are you- why are you reading the script? Hey, this is supposed to be me reading Diego's script. Get it- get the hell out of here! Get out! <laughs> get out! Alright. <clears throat> As someone who is more familiar with modern FPS games, I was concerned that the limitation would result in the gameplay feeling really shallow. But the game works around that limitation by having xenomorphs and facehuggers approach you in a zigzag pattern. So you have to stay one step ahead and anticipate these moves in order to efficiently land your shots. Diego was impressed by the fact that, despite this game coming out before the PlayStation got its first dual analog controller, it still managed to have an intuitive control scheme. Walking back and forth and turning is done with the D-pad, Strafing left and right is mapped to the L1 and R1 buttons respectively. It goes without saying that you'll be coming across the likes of Xenomorphs, Facehuggers, Chestbursters, and the Dog or Ox Alien hybrid, depending on which cut of Alien 3 you prefer. You'll also fight some humanoid enemies like infected colonists, androids, and those Wayland yutani dudes in bulky white armor that show up at the end of Alien 3. Facehuggers are surprisingly feeble here. Normally I'd be, well Diego would be, Paranoid of these little critters sneaking up on me for an instant death, but in this game they're more of a mild annoyance, obstructing your view for a couple of seconds and doing very little damage. The worst defense is the Alien Queen. The final level of each of the three chapters is a boss fight against the Queen. What is supposed to be an unstoppable killing machine unable to be bested amounts to a boss fight where I just stand there and shoot it until she drops dead. 
There's an animation of her taking damage that stun locks her as long as you keep shooting, making her completely defenseless. So much for the perfect organism! <laughs> I ad-libbed that, that wasn't in the script. Levels consist of simple objectives, like clear out the area of xenomorphs, activate some switches, collect ID tags, or find a stash of weapons. Checking these objectives off is made easy with the use of the game's in-game map that marks down any points of interest like breakable crates, doors, and switches. Every few levels you're given the chance to stock up on supplies in a sort of bonus level. You have 60 seconds to run around and pick up as many items as you can before time runs out. This is all well and good, but the game quickly becomes stale. There are 30 levels in total which results in an average time to beat of 8 hours. That may sound standard, but the game does very little to keep the experience fresh. The game frequently cycles the same four objectives throughout its levels, and when narrative elements are as few as they are, you find yourself glancing at your watch and wondering when the game is going to start wrapping things up. I think having something as simple as 2D cutscenes with still images and some VO every couple of levels or so could have gone a long way to keeping me more engaged. I, Diego, don't want to be too harsh on Alien Trilogy because despite its shortcomings, it's still a good first-person shooter that hasn't aged all that poorly. With some narrative context, I would easily recommend this game to any fans of the franchise. It's a strong foundation for future Alien first-person shooters to come. Aliens Online This one's a neat little Doom clone with some early online capabilities, with one team playing as Space Marines and the other as various types of alien enemies. This one went offline permanently, so whatever footage is online is what you get. I like how the UI for this game looks more like a stream layout than a HUD. It's even got a face cam. All it's missing is a chat making mean comments. Wow, after four years, the alien was able to turn his head slightly. Yeah, this wouldn't have been totally confusing and annoying back then. Slowing things down and creeping into a more survival horror experience, Alien Resurrection is a late PS1 game and even later movie tie-in. Released three years after the film and developed by Argonaut Games, Alien Resurrection went through several stages, at one point being a third-person action game akin to Tomb Raider. It eventually settled on being a slow-paced first-person shooter. I was blown away with how well it holds up graphically. It captures the tone of the film with its dimly lit corridors and mutilated bodies with their chests burst open, hinting at the deadly monsters you will inevitably face. That paired with screams echoing through hallways, footsteps scurrying inside vents, and the constant beep of your motion tractor results in an experience that, as the game advises, is best played in the dark. Unfortunately, Alien Resurrection is held back by brutal difficulty and unforgiving save points. Alien Resurrection came out during a time where first-person shooters on consoles were uncommon. It's no secret that FPS games dominated the PC gaming space, but Argonaut Games decided to bring that experience to consoles with a control scheme to redefine first-person shooters on consoles. Sadly, this control scheme just didn't jive with some players, claiming that it didn't make sense and was far too clunky. Let me take you back to the distant past of the year 2000 with an excerpt from a GameSpot review of Alien Resurrection. Quote, The game's control setup is its most terrifying element. The left analog stick moves you forward, back, and strafes right and left, while the right analog stick turns you and can be used to look up and down. Too often, you'll turn to face a foe and find that your weapon is aimed at the floor or ceiling while the alien gleefully hacks away at your midsection. End quote. Man, the guys at Argonaut Games were out of their minds. That control scheme would never catch on. Alright, it's easy to poke fun at a review from a time when a new control scheme was being introduced, and it seemed so obtuse to players back in the day. Just a year later, Halo would use the same control scheme and everyone reveled its innovation. I did experience some difficulty controlling the camera in my first few minutes, but it was more of a sensitivity problem than a control scheme one. Thankfully, Alien Resurrection offers mouse support, and not with a weird hack or mod, PlayStation had an official mouse periphery which quite a list of games supported. Games like point and click adventures, RTS games, and of course, FPS games. This is the way I chose to play Alien Resurrection, and I can wholeheartedly say that it is the best way to play it. This game expertly sets the stage with a setting that is ripped straight from the movies. The USM Auriga makes for the perfect setting to set a horror game in. The problem is that these environments start to blend faster than a xenomorph's growth spurt. Pick a level from the very beginning of the game and one from 7 hours in, and good luck picking out differences between them. When the game doesn't offer new visuals to look forward to when you beat a level, it quickly makes the experience feel repetitive. 
The fact that levels can stretch over an hour and, and the game asks you to backtrack through rooms and hallways that all look identical, it will have you running in circles. This is a shame because I usually like when games ask me to backtrack, explore, and solve environmental puzzles. But those aren't games that have distinct, memorable environments that allow you to draw a mental map because the rooms and hallways are so different from one another. This also could have easily been solved if Alien Resurrection offered an in-game map. Resource management is a crucial element here. Recklessly shoot your pulse rifle, not making the most of each bullet, or take hits like you have regenerating health, and you'll find yourself in a heap of trouble. Countless times I found myself inching my way through the spaceship, jumping at bursting pipes, counting every single med pack and bullet left in my inventory. Ammo gets especially scarce in later levels. The pistol does have unlimited ammo, but it's so weak against xenomorphs that you might as well be shooting spitballs at them. It's best used against egg sacs and facehuggers. Getting facehugged in this game doesn't result in just simply taking damage or instantly dying. Your character passes out, and when you come to, you'll notice an extra meter underneath your health bar. At this time, you are impregnated with a xenomorph embryo, and when that meter runs out, the little bastard bursts out of your chest, and then you die. To avoid this, you can pick up an item called the Portable Auto Dock. This device will irradiate the embryo inside you and kill it. Where does it go once it's dead? I find it best not to ask. But this feature goes even deeper. If you have an embryo inside of you, Xenomorphs will be less aggressive towards you, sometimes outright ignoring you if not for a short time. This has its obvious strategic implications. You can take advantage of these docile moments of the Xenos to do some damage. The Xenomorph's AI isn't the most advanced thing in the world, for the most part they just rush at you from the front, but they do have their cunning moments of sneaking up behind you and following you into vents. On the other hand, ladders seem to be their biggest weakness. If you climb up or down a ladder while they're chasing you, consider yourself victorious. Despite being able to cling to walls, aliens will just stare at ladders as you empty a clip into them. I feel really conflicted about this game. I think it does a great job building tension and keeping the player on edge, but damn does it waste no time in ramping up its difficulty. Xenomorphs can be taken off fairly easy with a pulse rifle, but you have to be quick and not let them get too close. They will make quick work of you, and running is not an option. It literally isn't. You're stuck with a painfully slow walk throughout the whole game. There's also no stealth system, so don't bother hiding. This harsh difficulty is made even worse by the manual save points that are few and far between. I really like manual save points in horror games. I think they add a lot of suspense when you go a while without running into one and you've made substantial progress. Walking into a save room and letting out that sigh of relief are some of my favorite moments in horror games. But Alien Resurrection is far too stingy when it comes to save points. I experienced instances where I wouldn't come a save point for up to 30 minutes. That's a lot of game time to replay if I were to die. Game time where I'm constantly stressed about the troubles I can run into with every step I take. That kind of stress is more induced with frustration rather than the good kind that comes with being spooked. For a game that's based on a movie, it's devoid of many narrative elements. For one, there isn't any voice acting, except at the very beginning of the game and once more at the end. Dialogue is mostly delivered through text within cutscenes that mainly consist of a computer terminal displaying a character portrait that resembles the actors as much as a facehugger respects your personal space. You get to play as different characters from the movie such as Call and De Stefano. They don't offer unique abilities, but they do have some weapons that are exclusive to them. To be frank, had I not been given the context of the movie, I probably wouldn't know what the hell was even going on in this game. What I do know is that this game really likes the plot point where Ripley Mercy kills one of her clones. Almost every mission I played had me destroy Ripley clones didn't matter who I was playing as. Ripley being a clone in Alien Resurrection was a really dumb choice, so maybe this game having you kill so many of them is symbolic of the fans disdain. Alien Resurrection is the kind of game you want to see succeed. It has the pillars that make a great survival horror game. Atmosphere, tense heart pounding moments, resource management, atmosphere, tense heart pounding moments, resource management, and exploration. But there's a balance that needs to be struck between keeping the player on edge but hopeful enough that they'll survive those insurmountable odds and make it to the next save point. The further I got into the game, the more I felt like I was inevitably going to hit a wall because of the game's relentless difficulty. 
which is exactly what happened. It's not often that I give up on a game when I'm so far into it, but my save file was ruined with my character having critically low resources. The game does have cheats, so maybe I'll see it through that way, or maybe I'll start fresh someday with some insight and see how it goes, because Alien Resurrection does have glimmers of greatness. It just needs to balance out its difficulty. If there's anything that 80s action movies have taught me, it's that any good, strong female protagonist is topping a jittery shotgun-wielding Michael Bean. Hauling cargo across space can be a pretty lengthy endeavor, so it's a good idea to bring some entertainment in case one of those cryopods croaks on you. A good old Game Boy never let me down. Alien's Thanatos Encounter is a top-down shooter developed by Wicked Witch Software for the Game Boy Color. You take control of a team made up of five marines on a rescue mission aboard the Thanatos freighter. It's been infested with xenomorphs and it's up to you to rescue the crew and clear 12 stages of aliens. Each marine has different stats giving them different speeds and health points. If you lose all your health, you pick the next available marine from your team and start from the beginning of the level. But there's still hope for the previous marine. With the new marine, you're given a time limit to rescue your fallen brother or sister. This is a cool idea, but when you start as a new marine, all the enemies respawn and I always found the time limit to be unforgiving. The game offers three control schemes for shooting. One that allows you to strafe, one that locks you in place as you shoot, and one that lets you run and gun. Regardless, I still found the controls to feel clunky, and landing shots on the Xenos was always tough. Thanatos and Connor has some cool ideas with having unique marines, but they could have done with some refining. Thankfully, the next game takes that concept and makes it even better. Alien Infestation is a 2D Metroidvania developed by WayForward Technologies and Gearbox Software. Released in 2011 for the Nintendo DS, this game follows a group of marines of the USS Sephora that discover the USS Salego after the events of Aliens. Their mission is to track down and recover the life form detected within the ship. Along the way, they get to partake in their favorite pastime of killing bugs and sticking it to the sleazy company man. I immediately fell in love with this game. First off, the graphics are beautiful. Everyone knows that 16-bit graphics are timeless and can capture different tones by using the right color palette. Even though it has a vibrant look, Infestation translates eerie, recognizable locations from the movies into a more cartoony take. They even hired comic book artist Chris Bachelot to illustrate the box art and in-game character portraits. His art style adds a lot of personality to each character just through their designs. You can expect all the usual gameplay elements from Metroidvania games you've played before. Exploration, backtracking, and gathering equipment that will help you access previously inaccessible areas. I'm a big fan of this gameplay loop, though admittedly there's been an oversaturation of the genre in recent years, especially in the indie space. But I'll shamelessly admit that slapping aliens in the title is more than enough reason for me to play it. Although it's very similar to other games in the genre, I do like that this game has some quality of life improvements that I personally haven't seen done in other games. This is obvious given that it's on the DS, but having the map be constantly available to you since it's in the bottom screen is a huge convenience. And with a simple screen tap, you switch over to your inventory screen. Smooth. You can also drop a flare, which puts a marker on the map if you want to keep track of any points of interest. This should be in every Metroidvania game. These games tend to have a big, sprawling map, and finding your way back to a specific room can be one hell of a mission. This story follows familiar themes of the movies, with the big wigs of the Whaling Corporation looking to capture and contain the Xenomorphs for military purposes. You'll explore recognizable settings like LV-426 and the USS Saleco, but the game brings back the cool concept of having Xenomorph-animal hybrids, like these bulky ape Xenos, and what I guess is supposed to be an elephant Xenomorph or maybe an alien species that resembles an elephant? Whoa, what the fuck is that? Is that an elephant xenomorph? What the hell? Either way, it makes for a sick boss character. Which can be said for just about every boss in the game. These guys can get really tough to take down, taking up everything in your inventory before finally hitting the ground. As a 2D side-scroller, I was worried that the combat system would end up feeling shallow, but I found myself getting into some pretty intense encounters against Xenomorphs when they would come in numbers. Dodging an attack and shooting the enemy afterwards feels satisfying. I also love that you're able to walk backwards as you shoot, putting some distance between you and the bugs. You also go up against androids and human enemies. 
Taking out androids is really simple, but fighting the human enemies is the weakest part of the game. You're incentivized to use this game's cover system to avoid taking enemy fire, but ducking behind cover and waiting for the enemy to pop up giving you a short window to land your shots is really tedious and slows the game pace to a grinding halt. Running your way from a fight is also a valid strategy, especially when you're low on health. Gunning your way towards a save point while you're on critical health are really tense moments. The coolest aspect this game has to offer is its permadeath feature. You start the game with 4 marines, each with their own personality, that even reflects by having different dialogue when interacting with NPCs depending on who you're playing as. If any of those marines happens to die on the field, they are dead dead. You then pick a different marine from the ones you have left. They essentially act as your lives, and if all of them die on you, it's game over and you have to load from your last checkpoint. Luckily, there are other marines that you can encounter throughout the levels, and if you have an open spot on your roster, you can recruit them. If not, then they'll just stay where they are on the map and you can come back to them whenever you do have an opening. This is an awesome concept, because each marine has a unique personality. I like certain ones more than others, and I grew an attachment to them. And when they did die, I actually cared, and I, I got a little sad for a little bit, you know? My favorite character was this conniving looking guy. He had a smile that rubbed me the wrong way, and I felt like I couldn't trust him. So I put off playing as him, and kept him as a bench warmer until his time came and he stood up to the shady company man trying to weaponize the Xenos. His best interest lied in the survival of mankind and he sacrificed himself in a big fight against a super mega alien queen. He will be missed. Um, what's his face? Alien Infestation is another awesome metroidvania that might have snuck under some people's radar. There are tons of other games of this kind. But I think having characters with unique personalities to play as, along with the permadeath feature, goes a long way in making this game feel special. Wait, how does it know not to track your motion if you're in the same room as me? Does it count me moving the thing? What counts as motion? Can the air set this thing off because the wind moves? Damn it. This is what I was afraid of. Those things hold monstrosities beyond what you can imagine. What, like a uh, scorpion with a penis attached to it that does horrible things to your face? Worse. God, what the hell is that? Well, it's an interesting combination of elements making it a tough little son of a bitch. Aliens Comfortable Maracas is a 2013 first person shooter developed by the same studio that brought you Borderlands. And also Duke Nukem Forever. It falls more in line with the quality of the latter unfortunately. Aliens Collectible Marijuana has been a punching bag for Aliens fans and general audiences for nearly a decade now. Known for its legendarily buggy launch, troubled development full of corporate politics, and its overall negative reception. Sega acquired the license to make a brand new Alien-based game in 2006 and planned two projects, an RPG action game by Obsidian Entertainment that was later cancelled, and a first-person shooter by Gearbox and immediately announced both of these games right after getting the license. They hadn't even started making them yet, but they wanted everyone excited for this stuff. For the FPS game, Gearbox Software decided they were more excited for Borderlands and went to focus primarily on that game while Aliens was left on the back burner for a few years. Then Borderlands was a massive success, and they wanted to immediately work on the sequel to that. So they outsourced Aliens to Timegate Studios, who started working on it in 2010. So everyone involved had the ability to work on this game for seven years, but procrastinated away four of it. Alright, now what? Publisher meddling, oh joy. 
So, Sega was like, hey, make it like Call of Duty, that's hip right now, it's 2010, and Timegate and Gearbox were like, what the fuck are you talking about, it's a horror game. The game was also too graphically intensive to run on consoles at the time, and they had to scale everything way down to function on Xbox 360 and PS3. This resulted in a class action lawsuit for false advertisement because the demo for the game looked nothing like the final product. Where have we heard that story before? Then Gearbox finished Borderlands 2 and finally wanted to give this thing a shot. So they took it back from Timegate in 2012 and realized it was really messy and buggy and not working on PS3 and it was supposed to release in February 2013 so they had to just try to make it work anyway with the short time allotted. Somewhere in the middle there it was cancelled and uncancelled, the story was being written while they were working on levels so a lot of content was cut or heavily altered and Gearbox and Timegate argued a lot about who contributed what and how much of it was whose fault. Gearbox's head guy swears that Timegate only contributed about 20-25% to 25 of the finished game in the three years they worked on it, while Gearbox supposedly did all the rest in just nine months. If that story is true, then this game was pretty much made in less than a year. Given the state of it at launch, that's kind of believable. The result of this chaotic development is a messy pseudo-sequel with ugly and unpolished graphics, dead-eyed and disinteresting characters, stiff and unsatisfying combat, and a story that makes about as much sense as trying to find a practical use for an infinitely spawning space monster that can't be trained or domesticated. So even though the second movie ends with the colony Hadley's Hope being obliterated in a nuclear blast and all four of our characters taking the Sulaco to fly away into space, the game starts with those characters nowhere to be found the Sulaco is back where it was in orbit over the colony, and the colony is only lightly singed. The recreation of these set pieces is cool, I guess, but the implementation of these is so clumsy and poorly thought out. You play as generic PS3 era video game protagonist number 83, along with a cast of not very well developed marines checking up on the Sulaco. Upon entering, aliens kill everyone. Then you find out once again, Wayland yutani is there to harvest and experiment with alien eggs and six a force of space mercenaries on you. Then you guys fight and crash into the planet, and one of your homies is an expecting mother for a horrible monster, so you fight your way through hordes of soldiers and occasionally aliens to find a way to help her out. Fruitlessly, I might add. Strangely enough, this is remarkably similar to the story of the AVP 2010 game up to this point. Until it diverges from here when the Marines learn that one of their own is being held captive by the company, and they're honor bound to go get him out. Another interesting factoid about this game is that its enemy AI was so broken on launch because of the letter A. Once that spelling error was corrected, it fixed the majority of the bugs, so unfortunately I can't report that this game was hilariously broken. It's functional now, and just kind of bland. The aliens attack you and come in nearly endless waves. For video game purposes, randomly there will be special types of xenomorphs for unique encounters, like these ones that explode and can't see you, the acid spitting ones, and this big one with a cool skull face that kills you in one hit. They set this guy up to be kind of like a Mr. X slash Nemesis style enemy, where it would chase you around and the only option was to run because your weapons are ineffective. Of all the ideas in this game, I like this one the most because I felt some genuine tension trying to weld doors shut while this thing was chasing me, or when I was having to run for cover in narrow spaces so it couldn't catch me. It's almost like a whole game about that would be way better. But that just ends in a stilted boss fight in the power loader midway through the game that feels like Rock'em Sock'em Robots underwater. The gunplay isn't fun enough to keep me invested. The bullet spread on all of the weapons is so annoying that even aiming down the sights feels like wild, uncontrolled firing from the hip. In theory, that would make the combat more hectic and stressful while aliens are bearing down on you, but in execution, it's just frustrating that you have to fire so many shots for so few to actually make contact, and that frustration carries over to the human enemies. That's right, for long slices of this game's runtime, you're battling normal guys with guns working for Wayland yutani I think this and the 2010 AVP game make the same mistake of introducing gunplay with humanoid enemies. 
For one, it's just not scary, but it also contradicts one of the central ideas of the movie. You know, the whole thing where the Marines were a tool for a sleazy corporation. Their lives were totally expendable as long as it was helping to line the pockets of some sissy businessman guy. Now there's this harsh disconnect where the Marines are the good guy superheroes and Wayland yutani is outsourcing their evil shenanigans to faceless mercenaries or androids. In a game that would be more honest to the source material, we wouldn't be fighting this guy. We would be playing as this guy. But these games don't feel like tackling themes that lofty, so we're shooting clearly marked white armored Halo guys that are specifically designed to be distinct from the other generic gun toting characters running around. Sometimes I forget there are aliens in this game, and that's a huge problem. It dips so far into just being another dime a dozen sci fi military shooter game that we saw a million of around this time. I'll say this game definitely gets better after the awful first impression of the first two missions. As soon as you get down on the planet, it becomes a lot more digestible. I still wish the level design allowed you more exploration. This game almost feels like one of those alien arcade rail shooters that you used to play in the before times. It's so linear and you're always having your hand held by an invincible AI companion who tells you which things to shoot at. Shoot the fuel tanks around the APC! Colloquial marinara sauce would be so much more tense if you were alone and isolated with no companions to assure you were crack wise. The addition of the motion tracker is neat, but it isn't really helpful outside of just highlighting your objective marker. It never really added to the tension or helped me get the drop on my enemies, because all of them come straight at you screaming and flailing their arms like a Joan and Vasquez character. In addition to locations from the second movie that shouldn't still exist, you go to a location from the first movie. The spaceship that's not the one for Prometheus but looks just like that one. God damn, I don't remember those ships being that big. It's crazy to think that two different development teams around this same time built two totally different versions of this same set piece. One where you're quietly exploring in a cumbersome spacesuit and taking in the uneasy atmosphere, and the other where you're throwing grenades at stormtroopers with your friend who looks like Francis from Left 4 Dead. So you break into that ship to rescue the missing Marine and find out Alien 3's setup was even dumber, because that guy in the pod was actually a body double, while Wayland kidnapped the real Corporal Hicks to interrogate him. For some reason, ugh. Corporal Hicks, Michael Bean himself, said that he was disappointed to work on this game because everyone involved seemed pretty dispassionate. That disappointment comes across in his performance. He sounds like he's not having a great time and the script is so blech that it makes me sad. Wish had. What information did you give them, Corporal? Stuff they're gonna figure out anyway. Enough to keep me alive without saying much. It boggles my mind that 20th Century Fox still considers this canon, but not the other game that came out around that time. So now Hicks helps us exact revenge on Wayland yutani by stealing their ship and leaving them in the dust. I'll give this game one thing. It had an actual proper boss fight with an alien queen where it's chasing you and walking around. I like how the fight is more about crawling around in narrow spaces and finding a clever way to beat the queen instead of just brute forcing it by shooting her. It's not perfect, but it's the closest we got. The game ends on Hicks helping us to assassinate the head of the company, Michael Wayland, who is played by Lance Henriksen. In addition to Bishop, the other Bishop from this game, Carl Wayland from the AVP game, and Charles Bishop Wayland from the AVP movie. Half of the cast of characters in Alien lore are just Lance Henriksen, man. We got everything. And with that cryptic and severely unhyped note, you that's Aliens Colostomy marketing for ya. I think making a game exclusively about Marines was doomed from the start. The main point of the movie itself was that the Marines were mostly overconfident chumps. Absolutely badasses! Let's pack them in! Check it out. I am the ultimate badass. Yes, Me and my squad of ultimate badasses will protect you. They had their charm and were likable for sure, but the lesson was that for all their muscles, advanced weaponry, tactics, and bravado, they cut the power. What do you mean they cut the power? How could they cut the power, man? They're animals. I watched you two with trackers checking the corridors. Move! They were outgunned by an enemy force they considered to be dumb, savage animals. The real star was Ripley all along because she was clever and cunning and fighting for something greater than notoriety or just following orders from some corrupt suit. She was fighting to save an innocent little girl and fill the void in her life left from the loss of her own daughter after she was trapped in stasis for so long that she outlived her. 
What all these movies and games seem to forget is that as cool as the aliens and space marines are, they're all sort of one trick. The heart of the movie was Ripley trying to find a daughter to raise again after the alien took that away from her. Regaining her independence? And getting revenge for the life that she lost. Which is why... is the first really solid addition to the franchise in decades. It's not about a mother looking for her daughter, it's the opposite end of that story. You play as Amanda Ripley in her 20s, searching through space for any sign of her missing mother. It's about your mother. We think we may have found her, Amanda. I know why you're working in the region where she went missing. You're still looking, aren't you? There's even an android here! But he's not Lance Henriksen, finally. Oh my god, I was starting to get sick of that. A ship by the name of the Sevastopol is in the region of space where Ripley went missing and gets a hold of the flight recorder from the Nostromo. Naturally, Ripley Jr. and a crew of characters jump at the opportunity to find out what happened to the ill-fated space trucker mission. Once there, they realize everyone aboard this massive ship has lost their damn mind and are going full Walking Dead survivors, grouping up in teams and killing each other for supplies or safety while an ambivalent force of robotic workers prevents them from getting help. What sparked this catastrophic turn of events? I'll give you two guesses. This game is everything Colonial Marines was not. It has heart and emotion. It has an interesting hook. It fits well into the mythos and doesn't obnoxiously retcon a bunch of bullshit to allow for recognizable levels in game. They wanted to recreate the halls and various rooms of the Nostromo, so they added a ship that's the same make and model for our characters to travel to the main setting in. The game doesn't assert that this explosion only lightly damaged the thing and it's still perfectly fine with the same alien in it. That's a perfectly reasonable justification to get this set piece in. And frankly, it's pretty awesome. A lot of care and love was put into recreating the entire ship to match the movie set exactly. It's just the place where the tutorial happens. They start you off somewhere familiar before you get to the Resident Evil mansion in space that is Sevastopol. This station is cool because it feels like it's massive and could go on forever, but it's actually smaller than you'd think and a lot of its areas tend to loop back in on themselves once you've explored it for long enough. It houses many great, memorable, and unique set pieces where Amanda destroys her knees by crawling around nervously while various scary enemies search for her. They got a lot of the original cast from the movie back to reprise their roles in various audio logs, and there's even a DLC mission where you can play as Ripley and a few classic crew in missions reenacting scenes from the movie. See you, Ripley. By rights, it should have been me going in there. It was my choice, Dallas. Let's get this done. They were so dedicated to accuracy that they even filtered video footage on the monitors in the game through real VCRs to get that messy tracking look. It's the ultimate love letter. This is not an action game by any means. We're going full stealth. Think something more like Amnesia or Outlast. You get weapons, but they're only useful against certain enemies, while the alien itself is too tough for anything you throw at it, typically. They rolled with that idea of an impervious, unshakable single enemy stalking you throughout the game, and I think it was a perfect choice. The alien is finally scary again. Anytime you hear a drop down from the vents or kill some lonely wanderer in the halls nearby, you crap your space pants and immediately leap into the nearest hiding spot. Your motion tracker racks up the tension by serving as an additional set of eyes and ears for you. It's way more functional in a stealth setting when you need a clear idea of your surroundings. The trade-off is that enemies can also hear the beeping noise it makes and it's a risk to pull it out because you never know if someone's closer than you think and it'll give away your position. To make it more interesting than simply sneaking around the alien while he's distracted with an important phone call or using the can, you can also guide him by making racket with these devices, turning on speakers in the distance, or just simply making some noise near a group of people you desperately want dead. Boot up a requisitions android. Is he insane? Her friend is Murder, the alien killed them all. I just accidentally knocked on the wall there. You can also use Molotovs, pipe bombs, smoke grenades, and a hammer to smack your enemies across the face. The alien is no pushover though and has some very complex AI that starts to adapt to your tricks. Once you use one gag too many times, it stops falling for it and starts ignoring the traps or sleight of hand. It can even set traps of its own. When the alien is around, the game is for sure never boring. I also love the feature on next-gen for turning on your mic so the alien can hear you speaking. 
Sometimes I let out a deep sigh of relief and a snappy quip when he left the room, only for him to come sprinting back full force because I forgot the mic was on. Sometimes my cat would also just waddle in and say hi, only for me to get shredded by the stabby mouth. Thanks, guys! I'll think twice about running back into the self-destructing ship to save you, turncoats! Good to see a friendly face. A neat piece of world building is the addition of the Working Joe androids. See, most people in the Alien universe were getting tired of all the Lance Henriksons and Michael Fassbenders running around with shifting allegiances. So a competitor company created a cheaper, easily identifiable type of android that would feel safer to be around. Now you don't have to look at all your co-workers and wonder which one of them could secretly be a corporate drone hired to break your neck for exposing your boss's embezzling. It's that one right there! Fuck that guy! These robots are tougher than average humans and are just generally unnerving to be surrounded by if they catch you. I appreciate that they added another creepy antagonist on top of the alien to mix it up. And they didn't just make it another lazy variant action figure of the classic alien. This game's level design ramps up the tension even more by creating a lot of arenas for you to hide in from the alien. Large circular enclosures with vents and smaller spaces and waist high cover where everything always leads back to everything else. Then they throw you a curveball with scenarios where there's only one way to go and you're forced to go down a straight hallway with no hiding places to get to the next section. I do wish it was easier to navigate around though because sometimes it's easy to get really lost. The biggest setback about this game for me is that it has a length issue. Well, that's to be expected, right? Most horror games are pretty short any- Wait, wait this game is like 18 hours? And they make you work for it to see that alien initially. You can play this game for like two hours and not see it. Then it drops in on you and you spend like the next nine hours gasping for air at any chance at a break from it. It just never leaves you the fuck alone. Spoilers here, shut up. Then you kill the thing and the game weirdly just keeps going because all the robots have gone rogue and are killing people by the truckload. And you spend like three hours figuring that out. Then the remainder of the game getting chased around by like five more aliens. The big twist was that it wasn't one alien all along, but actually a handful of them taking turns chasing you. What is this, a Batman story? The game is well designed and has interesting levels and story beats and concepts, but god does it start to drag on and on. I'm almost not even sad that this didn't get a sequel because it's like 2.5 games in one. The post-alien death section where you're only dealing with robots could have definitely been cut down for pacing because it runs on for so long that you once again forget this is an alien game. It feels more like a high budget indie game about rogue robots killing people in the future. I, I, and I'm, I'm not emotionally ready to play another one of those, I still haven't recovered from last time. But hey, how often do you hear people complain about a well made game that gave them too much content? It's long, sure, but they want you to get your bang for your buck and have as many chances to play unscripted hide and seek with the space bug in this game as possible. You know, because licensed games like this always have unsure futures. Thankfully though, you got a really great scene where Sigourney Weaver's Ripley sends a final goodbye to Amanda before her 57 year disappearance. And Amanda has some heartbreaking closure to the mystery. We knew the answer all along, but it was important for her to see it. Don't worry about me. I'm sure I'll see you very soon. I love you, sweetheart. We all know that in the end, she made it out and lived a long, happy life. Amy. It gives this scene from the sequel so much more weight, in my opinion, knowing that Amanda went looking for her mother and had a few adventures of her own. As awesome as Alien Isolation is, it unfortunately didn't sell well enough to warrant a sequel. In my opinion, it's a gem for the survival horror genre, and well worth it to play for fans of Aliens, or just fans of horror games. Well, hold on, hold your horses, we did get a sequel, just one in the form that no one really asked for. Alien Blackout was released in 2019 and developed by D3Go, and it is a mobile game. Furthermore, it's in the style of Matt Pat's famous cash cow, Five Nights at Freddy's. Hello internet, welcome to a class A disappointment. I was never a fan of the biggest sensation from six years ago. What do you even call these games? Point and click make me flinchathons? Survival screamulators? Not to rag on anyone that enjoys those games, they're just not my thing. I felt the gameplay was a little shallow and constricted. Unlike the idea of bouncing back and forth between different cameras, looking down hallways, and making sure that I'm distributing power to the proper doors. 
I like to be a little more involved in the action, you know? I want to get in there and get my hands dirty and explore different environments, not be glued to a chair watching security monitors. Once again, we take control of Amanda Ripley following the events of Alien Isolation. She is rescued by crew members of the Mendel Station, and she is put into cryosleep to begin her recovery. While she's peacefully counting sheep, Ripley's greatest woes slaughter the crew among the station, and she wakes up to an all too familiar nightmare. Somehow, a xenomorph has invaded the station. Also, the Halden has docked onto Mendel Station after suffering from damage. The commercial shuttle is carrying two crew members and two passengers. Sato, Studwick, Thorncroft, and Neiko Yutani. Neiko Yutani is the second cousin to the original Yutani, and she uses her name to intimidate crew members and advance through the company. She's like the snotty, spoiled rich kid who feels entitled to everything because their dad is the manager of the local car dealership. Get over it, lady. Get your boots in the mud like the rest of us. From here on, you're tasked with getting this group of knuckleheads to safety, as you lead them through different sections of the Mendel Station, while avoiding this lanky SOB. And like I mentioned before, this gameplay style feels so mundane to me. You're holed up in a vent shaft as you monitor the crew members represented by dots on this map of the level. You can draw a pass for them to follow to their objectives, and command them to hide or run if the xenomorph is around. But this often can feel awkward. At times, the map is cluttered with different elements you can interact with, I found myself selecting a different crew member from the one I meant, or closing a door that I didn't mean to. And it's really frustrating when you lose a crew member because the controls worked against you. Keeping track of the Xenomorph is done so by using motion trackers placed in a couple hallways on the map. You can also fend off the Xenomorph by closing doors that will block his path to the crew members. Closing doors and activating motion trackers use up your limited energy, so you have to pick and choose what you want activated depending on where your crew members are in relation to the alien. This sounds like a fine premise to a game, having this unnerving pressure to ensure the survival of your crew members against this unstoppable killing machine. But the first problem is that I don't give the slightest shit about any of these bozos, so I might as well be controlling nameless dots that I have no emotional attachment to. Essentially, that's the game at its core, guiding dots to a particular point on the map, and if a few of them die along the way... Oh, Not right darn. Now. The only way to get a fail screen is if you run out of time or if all crew members die. You'll miss out on certain dialogue if not all the crew members are alive for the next level, but they're better served as distractions for the Xenomorph, while someone else is completing an objective. Oh, there is also another way to fail. The Xenomorph can track down Ripley and face her head on. You'll get an audio cue of it rustling through the vents and you have to close one of two before it gets to you, or... I'll admit that hearing the echoes of the Xenomorphs jetting his way down a vent as it makes his way to you is pretty scary. But again, that's because I'm in direct peril of the monster, not playing security guard at the mall during the graveyard shift. One of the more prominent aspects that Alien Isolation was praised for was the Xenomorph's AI. And rightfully so, having a consistent threat that adapts to the player's behavior is awesome and terrifying, and that's not at all here. I could honestly never gauge the alien's behavior, it mostly felt random. It would show up whenever it wanted to, I never felt like it was reacting to sound or if it would go to where the crew members were most active, sometimes he would just show up all the way on the other side of the level for no apparent reason. It supposedly reacts to you opening and closing doors, but that wasn't the case for me. For me it felt like it was all left up to chance, so I would just guide my crew through halls and maybe they'll run into the xenomorph, maybe not. And, well, that strategy worked for the most part. In a game where you'd imagine the most interesting part would be seeing how the alien reacts to sounds, movements, and patterns, it completely drops the ball. The best part of Alien Blackout is its visuals and audio. It captures the eerie atmosphere of isolation with dimly lit hallways, beeping computer terminals, and echoey vent shafts. It's really impressive for a game running on a mobile device. But sadly, you'll be spending more time staring at this low-tech computer terminal than using the cameras placed throughout the level. The story is a disappointing follow-up to Isolation. Not a whole lot happens. After waking up to find out that the entire crew of the Mendel Station has been slaughtered and guiding the newly docked crew of Halding to safety, we find out that the Xenomorph was being kept in the Mendel Station and the AI on board will be doing everything it can to protect the specimen. You know, usual Weyland-Yutani malarkey. 
At the end, Ripley manages to escape, destroying the Mendel Station and setting course to a manufacturing colony. Alien Blackout unfortunately doesn't live up to the masterclass in horror games that is Alien Isolation. I'll admit, it's unfair to compare it to a game that is of a completely different genre, but maybe making an Alien game of this style doomed it from the beginning. This is a niche genre that Five Nights at Freddy's owned, and it garnered this huge following from it. In my opinion, it just doesn't work for Alien. I'd rather face the monster head on and overcome the massive threat with my wits and endurance. Just as we were wrapping up editing for this video, Travis Scott and Emperor Palpatine's favorite concert venue added Ellen Ripley, the alien, a power loader arm, a colonial marine dropship, a chestburster emote, and a little backpack with Jones the Cat in it. I've never played this game before and I probably won't after this video is done, but fuck it, I decided to get that DLC and do the predator boss fight since it's a limited time thing and I've been caught by a predatory system that encourages impulse buying and addiction in small children. I am a small child with poor decision making skills. Thank god I can write off V-Bucks as a tax deduction. Honestly, I don't know much about Fortnite because I'm not into these flavor of the year multiplayer games, but these costumes and models are really nice and the animated intro is a fun addition. I actually had a lot of fun playing the Predator mission with friends to unlock that skin, and I was better at this game than I was expecting. Maybe that's because it's a game for 10 year olds, but let me have this, damn it! The alien in this art style looks like a grown up version of the dog in Planet 51. It's a little silly seeing the alien holding a gun, but you could always pretend that he's the android that was designed to look like a xenomorph from Alien Stronghold. Jerry the synthetic xenomorph! He can use guns and smoke cigars! And of course it's a really funny image seeing Ellen Ripley and a xenomorph standing side by side in a cramped hallway gunning down someone dressed like a sock monkey with AK-47s. Now with the power of modern gaming, you can watch two of the most terrifying monsters in fiction do the floss! It's alright I guess. Less of a downer to end on than the Blackout review, I suppose. So even though it started out pretty lame in the old days, it just keeps getting better and better. More dangerous every time we encounter it. It's the perfect organism! Nazi soldier, your days of hauling useless cargo are over. Now get on your feet and show these bugs what it really means to be a perfect organism. A sexual Tyrannosaurus! What? Oh, it'll be on your channel. Don't worry, it'll make sense. What's going on my channel?